Thank you, Kamel. So great to have you back. Uh, so uh, Janet and Christian have made my life very easy in terms of looking at uh, the past, the present, and the future immunization schedules. And so let me start by sort of uh, thinking about what an immunization schedule is. And I think you're going to find a couple of words here that are crucial, right? First is the ideal timing on when you're going to give these vaccines to anyone, children, adults or so, eh, to give them the best opportunity to get protected, but also to minimize risk. And I think those are three important components when you think about immunization schedules. Eh, there are other considerations, but those are the most important of why we sort of have a schedule. And, and But why do we care about a schedule? Eh, well, there are at least four things that are important. First, from the programmatic standpoint, many of you are immunization program managers. This gives you a framework of how you're going to deliver these vaccines, how you're going to take them to the population. It also gives you a, a way of evaluating your programs. So you know when these vaccines are being given. Uh, you can get coverage rates from the, the immunization schedule. For example, WHO uses the DTP-3 uh, uh, you know, measure in order to know if kids are getting three doses of DTP by one year of age. Uh, we also use the MMR1, for example, to see how many are getting uh, that vaccine by two years of age. It also provides a public uh, guidance of when they should show up to the clinics or wherever they're going to give vegan the vaccine in order to get immunized. For example, for COVID, it was very important to give people a framework of how they will get immunized. And then finally, it does help researchers and developers in terms of, of knowing how they're going to test their vaccines. And that is a very important issue because how, va how vaccine schedules are given will be a challenge for manufacturers in terms of how they test their vaccines. And that's important to keep in mind. So you also heard a lot about how, you know, it, the way that we sort of frame the schedule or design the schedule has to do with this risk of infection, right? What we're trying to protect is really that, that moment of when the child or the adult is more vulnerable. And, but how maternal antibodies may interfere with uh, that or protect the child. That's what they are there for. But, you know, they, they may interfere with the schedule. And uh, I'm going to change for next year the immunological maturation issue because Christian just told me that it's immunological transformation and not maturation. So that's going to change. But there's one more piece and that's the opportunity to to actually to vaccinate. And what we know is that people tend to sort of bring their children when they are younger to get vaccinated better than when they are older. So we don't do very well. Like mothers don't, don't do very well after, you know, the th second shot sort of to bring their children and fathers, I will say. Uh, yes, just to make it sure, right? And, uh, and, and the same for adults. In fact, we do very well with the first shot, but not very good with the second shot or the third shot. So that's important, right? But immunization schedules have not always been very rigid, and they haven't been that complex. So this is the immunization schedule in 1960s uh, for the United States and uh, the United Kingdom. And what you can sort of see here is that they didn't give like two, four, six. They, they, they gave actually two months where people could come for vaccination, either in the United States or the United Kingdom. And, and so... The schedules were much more flexible before than what we had uh, up to now. Of course, now the schedule is quite complex in the United States. It's very busy in the first few years of life uh, and is becoming busy also in other places in the world. So, you know, it's very clearly that, you know, we are schedules have become, you know, something that we need to reflect on and parents actually need a lot of guidance for it. Uh, for the rest of the world, in fact, uh, uh, we call it the EPI schedule, and that's from Expanded Program of Immunization. That program is going to turn 50 years next year, if I'm not mistaken. It started in 1974. Really, it was not a schedule. It was The purpose was to sort of expand the immunizations in the world. And so you saw by we went from 5% coverage of DTP-3 in 1974 to 1980s at 20%. And there, WHO decided to sort of bring some a group of experts, including Neil Halsey and others, to sort of review the immunization schedule and try to figure out how we can improve the coverage of those vaccines. And, and what they came up with is, you know, there were about 20 schedules, and they revised the evidence that we had at that moment, 
and decided that they, you know, that what they will do is come up with this schedule that was published in 1985. And that is basically to give these five antigen vaccines at birth six weeks, 10 weeks, 14 weeks, and the measles at nine months. And, and that had a, the major reason for that was to try to get those vaccines as early as possible so people will be protected and not to miss any of the coverage that we had. Okay. And probably one of the examples of how they review the evidence is this on measles. Uh, you know, these are uh, the circumversion to measles vaccine, depending on the age that you were vaccinated. You see when you are six months, it's about 50 to 60% circumversion. When you get to be past 12 months of age, it's almost 90% or above. Uh, but we knew that in many countries, measles was happening very early in life and infants were dying. So uh, the decision was made that nine months was the cutoff for sort of getting that protection, that balance of protection, plus, you know, making sure that we got a, enough immunogenicity. But we do know that uh, that schedule does leave uh, some children, you know, unprotected or susceptible. So this is a study that was recently published. It looked at, uh, you know, depending on when you got immunized and the line, look at the red line, is the proportion of people that you are leaving uh, susceptible to the vaccine. So there is a, a proportion of people between, you know, 5% or so that will be susceptible, that will not respond to the first dose of measles vaccine. And therefore you need a second dose of vaccine, not as a boost, but really to catch up or sort of make sure that you immunize those five to 10%. And what this graph tells you is that the older you are, when you receive that measles vaccine, the less likely that you're gonna have interference with maternal antibodies and therefore you're gonna seroconvert better. So we know that now that many countries have moved to 12 month measles vaccine because that's a better timing for actually getting people seroconverted if you're gonna give one or two doses. Uh, and many countries, but many countries in Africa and Asia still use the nine month schedule, right? The good news is that the second dose of measles vaccine restores a lot of that or sort of covers that gap of five to 10% that we leave without uh, protection. And, uh, and over the last three or four years, there has been this incredible uh, uh, number of countries that have introduced the second dose of measles vaccine. And this is really going to help in terms of consolidating that response and, and protection to measles. Now, one thing for you to be aware of is that uh, while this is great in terms of immunization with measles, we at least have data from two countries, Belgium and Canada, and there's a little bit of data coming from developing countries now that for measles, uh, mothers actually made better responses or stronger immun immunological responses to the natural measles that they do to the vaccine. And therefore what happens is when they transfer that maternal antibody, the maternal antibody of those mothers that are vaccinated wanes earlier. And that means that children are leave, left more susceptible earlier than if they had natural infection. Now, remember a lot of the studies that were done for the original schedule were done in mothers that had had natural measles. So now we know that there is a, a good proportion of infants that are being left without protection earlier. And that's important because you see in many European countries and, and even the United States that when we have outbreaks of measles, uh, we are seeing these infants getting more sick. And normally the recommendation is if you have an outbreak, you should give a dose at six months of age because then that pro provides that protection, even though we don't count that, that as, a, as a true dose, right? Now for the infant schedule, we have three or four patterns of sort of how immunization schedules are done, right? So I told you already the 6, 10, 14 week schedule that is a, a recommended or was recommended in the past by World Health Organization that's mainly sort of done in Africa and Southeast Asia. Uh, we have the two, four, six month schedule that is the, the United States schedule that also is followed in Latin America and in other European countries. Uh, you have the rapid two, three, four month schedule that the UK uh, uses uh, uh, and some countries have modified to sort of do it instead of four or five months. And then you have what I call the Nordic schedule that is three, five and 12 months and is uh, mainly done in the Nordic countries plus Italy and uh, 
actually a very good schedule in terms of how it provides protection. So this is the data of how that a 6, 10, 14 week schedule came about, but also showing you in this very complex style a slide the diphtheria and tetanus. And for both what I'm going to ask you to sort of think about, any orange bar is looking at if you give a, the vaccines monthly, meaning two, four, a, two three, four, or a, four, five, six, for example. And in blue is those schedules that are using a two-month interval, meaning that they are using two months in between. And, and I think the pattern that you start to see is that when you have a, a, any interval that is less than one month, you have less immunogenicity of these antigens. And if you start a little bit later, it's better. And I think that correlates very well with what Christian just told you, that, you know, it's good for these children to start a bit later, but not too late that you're going to get, you know, a risk of infection. So this is important because we're going to see it again um, in this big study that was a pool of data from 32 studies, uh, 7,600 children. And what this is telling you here is, is a, again, again, a complex slide. But, uh, you know, for any antigen, diphtheria, tetanus, or pertussis, what you see, the more maternal antibody the child has, the lower the responses, uh, you know, you get. And if you sort of start older for children, the better responses you get. And that almost replicates for any vaccine that we have in the, in the infant schedule. This is what we have done with pneumococcal uh, vaccine, which is, oh, again, fantastic. Uh, Keith already showed you on Monday how we have a, now most countries using this vaccine, although the schedules are quite different. Most countries in the world are using two plus one, meaning that they are doing two doses in the first year with a booster dose. Usually they are doing two, four, but in some of the you know countries in Africa, they are using 610, which I think is the, the most common way that they are administering. Some of the countries are using three plus zero. And of course, the United States is, the, is uh, and I think uh, UAE are the only countries using three plus one schedule, so four doses in the schedule. And and the key here is that again, if you look at the studies that have been done in the Netherlands uh, using two four six versus three five versus two three four, which is the UK schedule, you will see that for most serotypes, the two three four schedule again a shortened interval. And starting early, does less um, a, of an immunogenicity than the other schedules. To compare two doses at three, three and five, those almost equivalent to two, four, six. So clearly showing you that that's the, that's important for the first three doses. However, when you go to the booster dose, everything gets corrected. So the booster dose is very crucial for whatever we do in the first year of life. Okay. So early short, and then the booster compensates for the primary series shortcoming. So you're going to ask me, so, but we actually introduced the schedule in Africa or, you know, Southeast Asia in 16 and 14, and we do well. We have seen heat coming down. We actually control most of the infections. So why are you telling us that the, the, the schedule doesn't work? Well, the truth of the matter is when people have looked at when people are receiving these doses, they are not getting it at 6, 10, 14. On average, they are getting at 2.5, 4.5, and 8 months. So that's what reality is. This is not what, you know, people are saying 6, 10, 14, but truly when they go and give the doses, this is when average of the children are receiving those doses. So it's likely that, you know, in reality, the schedule is behaving like a 2, 5, and 8-month schedule rather than a 6, 10, 14. Okay, one thing that you also have to keep in mind is that there are more and more premature infants uh, being alive and born, and uh, the, that those rates change uh, around the world. But we know that at least for hemophilus influenza and, pertos, or, and pneumococcal vaccine, prematurity is an important risk factor for breakthrough infection. So these children need special protection. And I think there are a couple studies, at least this one here from the UK, showing that, that for premature infants, the best schedule is if you give them three doses, especially if you give them three doses, two, four, and six months, because they're going to get a better response than if you go two, four months, or you go the UK schedule two, three, four months rapidly. So clearly, again, 
premature infants will have, you have to keep them in mind, but they, because they are becoming an important population that we need to protect. And the, the later that we start the schedule with them, but also the more interval that we put into, into the schedule, the better it's going to be for these infants. So should we do away with the 6, 10, 14? My opinion is yes. You know, it provides suboptimal uh, maternal responses, uh, you know, has interference with the maternal antibody, requires more doses than what we are using, right, what we should be using. And is not being implemented as such. In real life, the schedule is really two to four, five to eight months. And I think it leads also to substandard vaccine schedule research. So you heard from Kathy recently that she, they were testing the pertussis at, you know, six, 10, 14 weeks. So her study is going to be very well done with a protocol, but she's challenging that vaccine to be tested too early, you know, with shorter intervals and probably your immunogenicity is not going to be the same. So we'll talk about why many African countries and uh, in Southeast Asia are not doing that, and mainly because they are waiting for WHO to tell them to change. But if you talk to Philip, he'll say, we're not telling them to use the 1614 schedule. In fact, these are the immunization tables that are being given by WHO to the countries. And the immunization tables in no way says that you should use the 1614 schedule. What it says is number of doses that you need to give to children. And then what it says is the minimum and maximum times where you should give the vaccines. But I don't see in the tables in any way that 6, 10, 14 should be your schedule. So for me, it's just a matter of willingness of the countries of sort of moving to a schedule that really is going to work for them. Okay. So some countries are a bit more or less risk averse, more able to sort of look into different schedules. And you heard from um, David Goldblatt about the schedule that they proposed in the UK. The only reason I'm showing this slide is because I think in many countries, you know, if you move to less doses of vaccine, it's going to allow you to introduce more vaccines in the future. And it's going to, it's really safe, right? Because one of the big questions that people have is, well, you know, we do 6, 10, 14, because we know that people only take two doses. And so 6, 10, and then we, you know, at least we get two doses in the first month of life, at least in the first few months of life. In the United States, they tell you this, the same thing. Why are they using three plus one? Is because they say, well, you know, in reality, people may get two doses and one in the, in the booster sort of time. So that way we ensure that people have enough protection. But even the UK is showing you that one plus one is very good in terms of pneumococcal vaccine and probably will be good in, in most vaccines, except for probably diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. And the nice thing about it is not, not only they have shown that it's immunogenic, but now you saw the data from Vietnam, and this is the data from the UK, showing that they also have an effect on carriage of a, a vaccine serotypes. So this is how a... The serotypes change depending on how the schedules were. The two plus one is in red. The one plus one, all of these are pre-boost. These are post-boost of the vaccine. And you see that for any serotype, there was little change. But when you see the PCV13 serotypes, they were kept very low. Doesn't matter what, you know, schedule you use, uh, telling you that this vaccine works very well for sort of a uh, protecting against transmission. All right, but the big issue with most countries, Africa, Asia, some in Latin America, is we, we are not doing very good with the second year of immunization. And the boosters are not part of our standard schedule. Kathy told you, you know, part of the problem is that we don't have a booster uh, in Mali where basically you should be, uh, you know, getting a booster of, of most vaccines. So we need to do a better job of sort of getting that fourth dose of vaccines or whatever dose of vaccines you have in the second year of life. And I'm hoping that now that the second measles vaccine is coming along, that may help us sort of understand that we need that sort of second year of life immunization that is going to be crucial for most vaccines and it's going to allow you to release the schedule. Already uh, Janet told you about maternal immunization. The only thing that I have to say is that the schedules change a bit. Uh, and of course, you know, TD, TT and TDAP, we have more or less, you know, agree on the schedule. Influenza and COVID are, can be given uh, anytime during pregnancy, but there's going to be questions for the pregnant women when GBS vaccine comes along and when RSV comes along. 
Are we gonna, how are we gonna crowd those vaccines into the pregnant women and how are we gonna do it to sort of for her to feel safe and make sure that they correlate with certain, you know, timing, right? And we know again that that maternal immunization will start to influence the way that we look at the infant schedule. Because again, here's the level of maternal antibody, the more antibody you get from the mother, the, you know, the more you need to sort of delay your first doses of vaccines in order to sort of have the same take or the same immunogenesis that you had before. And, and here's an interesting study we did in Kathy and I didn't talk, but she was talking about her study in Mali. But this is a study actually done in Thailand. Uh, and that study looked at <clears throat> the mothers getting Tdap vaccine. And you see in white the cellular pertosis. You see in black the whole cell pertosis. And some ch some mothers didn't get any Tdap vaccine. And they sort of their children got the epi schedule with whole cell pertosis. And what you see is that there is an important interference of Tdap on the whole cell, on the children that receive whole cell pertosis, right? Uh, uh, you see it for, the, for both antigens, and that only gets somewhat restored by the booster dose. So important, what Kathy was telling you, has already been done in Thailand partially, and I think we will have more data on how we should be using these vaccines in the future. But it looks like it doesn't interfere as much with a cellular pertosis in the first year of life. It interferes more with whole cell pertosis. This is another study that is important because somebody was asking a question on, on polio. So this is mothers in the UK who got a um, Bustrix IPV or Repevax. So both have IPV containing. Uh, and you see the children getting then immunized with DTAP IPV and then what you see is here the seroconversion of the, of the two Bustrix and Repivax, both containing IPV, and you don't see any of the serotypes going above 45% in these children. When you look at the children that the, that the mothers didn't get any of these vaccines, your seroconversion is between 70 to 90%. So clearly, if you give IPV to the mother, a, she'll pass on antibodies, and that baby likely is going to be protected but also at the same time, it's gonna interfere with your vaccines. So if I can summarize for now, we're uh, doing the epi schedule or some countries are doing two, four, six. Uh, of course, there's more maternal immunization that is happening. If I had my way, the, what I will do is get rid of those two schedules, go like the Nordics do a three, five month schedule in the first year of life, because I know that maternal antibody is gonna cover the gap that are gonna have in the future, right? So ideally this is how we should be moving in the future, but it's gonna take more than just uh, my wishful thinking. A little bit of a adult immunization, uh, just to let you know that that's also becoming very complex. And there's a lot of questions about how to use uh, the pneumococcal vaccine, especially some groups need the vaccine when they are 50 and older, others 65 and older. And I don't think we have really agree over the world on how we're gonna be using these vaccines. The United States just sort of added the COVID-19 into the primary immunization schedule of adults. So that's becoming a bit more complex. And then, um, and finally, the other sort of big issue with immunization schedules is that we haven't done much data on the safety of the immunization schedules. Although the work that Matt Daly here and Jason Glantz have done is starting to look at sort of the influence of the immunization schedule on diabetes mellitus, for example, is important showing that, for example, the, num the, the amount of aluminum that you get exposed to is inversely related to diabetes. So the less aluminum you get, uh, the more diabetes you get. And so important sort of to start, to start telling people that immunization schedules have a safety component to it, okay. So in summary, immunization schedules are key to success of vaccinating and protecting populations and also guide research. So remember that, that the developers are looking for you in that sense. We probably should depart from the 6, 10, 14 schedule unless mandated by regulators. I don't think every regulator is, you know, in, on board or sort of mandating that schedule. And boosters are important for long-term protection and herd immunity. If you are leading any work on the national immunization pro uh, program, try to advocate for an optimized schedule. 
because that's going to be your best sort of bet for protecting the population and try to use the most effective evidence base and cost savings and parent acceptable schedule. We are having a lot of questions from parents of the number of vaccines in the first year. And finally, we need to work more on the maternal and adult schedule organization because I think that's the future for a lot of these vaccines. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that talk and also for being the minister previously. That was great. Um, um, my questions are sort of programmatic, but uh, kind of goes in two. Well, the first is if we know that 6 and 14 is actually 2, 5, 8, if we then advocate for a 3, 5, 12 vaccine, how do we know that's not going to actually turn into a 5, 11, 18 vaccine? And how do you sort of encourage real adherence to new schedules and related to that there's cost associated with changing a schedule in terms of training materials printing communication so at what point what's the decision making criteria for we there's enough need to make the change that it warrants that cost and how often yeah i'm glad that you're asking those i'll ask the i'll answer the second first so in Latin America, we went through a couple changes of schedules and the, and the, the cost was not as much as we thought, you know. I mean, certainly there's a, a education and adjustment of parents, but actually parents take on, you know, those va new vaccines and new schedules relatively well if you tell them why you're doing this. So I think uh, that, that being afraid of that is not as much. This, the second, the, the first question was, uh, how I make sure that, you know, I don't going to go now and sort of have more prolongation of the schedule if people are not showing up. And and the, the way to do this is really part of what they commented before, how you pack those immunizations to other things that the parents know that they need to do. And for the most part, I think, you know, I don't know if I will go three, five in many of the sort of low income countries, but at least the two, four, six is better than what we're using right now in terms of a, you know, a six, ten, fourteen, which again is not being administered as such. In Latin America, what we see is that people go for their first dose very well. So we get ninety percent for the first dose at two months. We get about eighty percent for the dose of four months. And then our problem is the third dose. We only get about 60 to 70% there. I usually is very much delayed past the six months of age. Usually it tends to be on an average at eight to nine months of age. But again, not a bad schedule if you've gotten at least two doses of vaccine. So back there and then yeah, Santosh and then. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, I think very good talk, very relevant for my work. And we just had a optimizing um, a cycle to look what was the best uh, immunization uh, program for the coming years, for the coming 10 years, I think. Um, but the thing is that NITEC does that. So I would like to advise the people who are the immunization managers to get yourself kind of, or talk with people in the NITEC, because at some point they, they only look from the infectiology and the epidemiology. And so sometimes they will come with an advice, okay, we'll shift this one from four years to five years. Well, there's a crucial difference in how that can be taken in practice. For I know, for example, shifting from that mm. to another to another age will be a, will really have a bad effect on the coverage. So, sure. um, but they kind of yeah throw yeah they say the practical things are for the implementation, but then the NITEC already publishes. This, and then it will get into the newspapers and it's very hard to say we're going to do something else. So I would just advise, it's a very important thing, do it, but just talk well with the NITEC that they take the practical specs with it because otherwise you get like kind of a mismatch. I, I agree. Yeah. I think any any discussion schedules have to be in conjunction. And I will say there's a third a group there and that's the parents. You need to get some information from the parents of how they are feeling about schedules. And, and we know that that's a, an important, know that we're going to take that, you know, science and sort of epidemiology take precedent, but, uh, but in a way also we need to understand what, how they are feeling and what they will do, especially parents that are pro vaccination, which, you know, who could give you a lot of sort of advice? Satosh. I had a question about the zero dose agenda, right? So you're seeing a lot of countries that have like 
not taken any vaccination in the first year of life. And, you know, some countries are really kind of, they don't have a policy um, recommendation for a missed dose, right? Like more so after infancy, right? So how do you advise country to make um, a schedule uh, for that that sort of a recommendation? So you're talking about, you know, they we're talking about the second year here. Yeah, second year. yeah, and the second year, I think, is something that WHO is now moving forward, but I would love to see more push because I think that second year of life immunization is going to come become very relevant for not only the boosters that we're talking about, uh, but also the catch-up immunization. I think uh, uh, many countries don't do catch-up immunization that much, and the, and the reason that they don't be is because there's no guide. And, you know, if they miss the third dose in the first year of life, it's gone, right? There's no way to sort of come back to that. And I think it, it will be very important for countries to sort of come up with that. And, and probably WHO to give some guidance, because I think in many ways, a, the immunization ty- tables are great, but they, and they do have something on catch up, but not enough to sort of uh, provide the guidance for countries. Okay, I'm going to go back first, you know, yeah. Thank you. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, talk. My question is that uh, on measles rubella, the recommended age is 12 months. Many Asian countries are uh, sticking to nine months. Uh, post-pandemic, there have been a lot of outbreaks in uh, many countries. Uh, so you, what's your take on reducing the age uh, from nine months to six months to in such a situation programmatically? Yeah, so... so the. There, I mean, the reason that we're getting more outbreaks now has to do with a lower coverage of vaccine during the pandemic. So we know that there are a lot of kids that are not vaccinated. And of course, when there's an outbreak, uh, what I think what I'm trying to show you is that, that you probably need to sort of temporarily uh, sort of uh, make sure that you protect those infants, right? Because the uh, children are becoming sort of a, a non-protected or not, you know, during those first six months of life. So you need to sort of start early at six months if you have a huge outbreak in your country because it's going to save a lot of infants from getting measles. Uh, But as soon as you sort of control the outbreak, then you should move back to your schedule where basically you're going to get the best out of your buck for your immunization. And that's probably going to be, if your country has a move to a 12-month schedule, then keep the nine month schedule, but, uh, uh, you know, you got to sort of move back to where you're going to get the best immunogenicity. Thank you. Again, to low and middle income countries, whereby we are not protected by maternal antibodies because there are no maternal vaccines. Mm -hmm. What is the benefit of changing the schedule from 6, 10 to 14 weeks where these infants are exposed much earlier and the health systems are much weaker and fragile in terms of yeah, and, and, and again, it's, it's an important issue. Uh, right now, the only vaccine that you will have issues with or, you know, issues with protection in a country that doesn't have maternal immunization with Tdap yet is going to be pertussis. Because then for the other vaccines, tetanus and diphtheria, you'll be, there's no reason to sort of start early, right? So, and even pertussis, I think what they have shown you is that even when we were doing a schedule it, that was sort of a shorter, we don't protect that much the first few months of life uh, because, you know, even if you get it at six weeks and 10 weeks, two doses in those sort of intervals, it won't give you enough to protect that group of infants enough to sort of prevent pertussis that much. So you are much better off sort of moving your schedule ahead because you're going to get, you know, better immunogenicity for the long run. And again, that infant is being infected by someone else. And what we are trying to do is reduce the, the amount of pertussis in the community, right? So I think, yes, the only problem will be pertussis. For the rest of vaccines, you probably will be better off sort of moving to a schedule that is 2-4 or 2-4-6. Okay, where do I go, Janet? Here. I'm Tabelo from Lesotho. Um, I'm really uncomfortable with the idea of shifting schedules, mm-hmm. especially if you say in reality they are coming much later. So you're actually saying they will be then be coming at, I don't know, five, six mm-hmm. uh, for, for, for the vaccine. And we've seen that the later they come in, 
um, the Leicester coverage, that makes me uncomfortable. And going back to issues around programmatic issues, we try and do things at the same time because it's not easy for mothers to come to health facilities. I don't know how the HIV program, for instance, would feel about having their six-week DNA PCR moved uh, um, further along. That's also an issue. Also, in settings where you've been doing 6, 10, 14, and yes, it's less immunogenic, but I'm not really seeing um, increase in disease burden. I'm not seeing breakthrough infections. I'm not seeing, um, you know, I'm not seeing outbreaks. Oh, what's, the, what's the added um, uh, benefit? Well, first of all, I show you that you're not giving the schedule as 6, 10, 14. So really, when you're saying I'm not seeing disease, it's because you're not using the schedule the way that you say that you're using it. So, so, and then what I will argue is a lot of pro things that we do, and this is, I can tell you because in looking at the U.S. immunization schedule, there's a nightmare of trying to modify the schedule because if you talk to the pediatricians, they say, well, that's when we get, you know, this developmental testing. This is when we get these other things done. But everything that was put into the child care was put in there because the immunizations were there first. So now we need to retake our immunization and say, can we move, you know, certain things that we do on the child later because, you know, uh, we need to sort of move the immunization schedule. And I think that's always going to be the the question and the and the uh, friction, I will say, right now, because we have added into the immunization schedule things that we do for the child, like HIV testing or, you know, anemia testing or, again, neurodevelopmental testing and talking to the mother certain things at certain ages. So so we will need to sort of look into those things if you want to modify your immunization schedule. But, it's, but the important thing is that you, are you getting what you are supposed to be getting from your immunization schedule? And I'm not sure you are. Yeah. So there has been a lot of different schedules all over the world, mm -hmm. and it has been seen that all of these, whatever schedule we use, the countries have been able to get rid of, take a good control of the vaccine preventable diseases. So rather than looking at which schedule we should follow, 6, 10, 14, or 2, 3, 6, that also depends on the country specific, like uh, sure. disease burden. So maybe what we should uh, emphasize is in the booster dose rather than the uh, 6 weeks or 2 months or uh, 3 weeks. And another thing is, I don't think there has been any like head to head uh, trial comparing uh, different schedules, right? So at present, yeah. we are doing one in Nepal and another, in, uh, we have two sites, Uganda and Nepal. We are, uh, I mean, comparing different schedules, five different schedules. And maybe that uh, study report uh, results will be a little bit helpful on deciding some of these. Yeah. And there are some data on some schedules. For example, we did some schedules for IPV, the BOPV IPV switch in Latin America, where we tested the, the 61014 versus the 246, even though we don't use the 61014 in Latin America, but we needed to provide information for the world. And um, what it was clear is that the 246 was much better for the IPV vaccine, for example. Uh, although, you know, we were using just one dose of IPV at 14 weeks, right? And uh, so, so yes, there's more research needed in immunization schedules in low-income countries. And I think uh, I wouldn't be surprised that you'll find the same that it has been found in other places, which is uh, the if you start a little bit later and if you do a two-month interval, that vaccine will give you more than if you do a shorter interval schedule. I think you have waited enough. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, Kristen from the U.S. I'm interested in your perspective. You know, when we look at those um, EPI recommendations on that complex table, um, if if it is, in fact, worth revisiting the way those recommendations are framed, because I take your point that there's nothing in there that prohibits a country or, or recommends against a country moving it out. But when I have these conversations with colleagues at, at WHO about potentially getting an advisory group together and, and reconsidering those, the concern I hear is that if they were to recommend a longer interval, what you, the side effect you might get is missed opportunities to vaccinate. If you have a child show up at seven weeks, but it says minimum eight weeks, then you may not see that child again, and then they don't get their second dose for a longer period. Um, and so I'm just curious on your thoughts whether, like, that is good the way it is, and now it's a country-led effort, or if there would be some room, or if it would be preferable to, to state yeah. some preference there for interval. So if I'm not mistaken, WHO five or six years ago, convene a group already looking at the schedule. And 
you know, they tried to do it and uh, they came about and said it's too complex. Like we cannot come up with a homogeneous schedule that people will, you know, follow. So I think it's very clear that they have given up in terms of saying, okay, this is the WHO recommended schedule. They, that's what the immunization tables came from. And, uh, and I think it's a matter of the countries. And I do acknowledge that countries need to sit down and discuss what their schedule is. And because it may work for one and not for another. So, so I think it's very hard to, and, and remember when, when the 61014 was sort of suggested was because we, we had very little, you know, coverage and we had very few vaccines. So it was much easier for people to put it in their framework. Finally, they had a schedule that they didn't have before. There were 20 scheduled before. But I think we're at a point now that what we need to say is countries need to sit down and sort of look at their schedule and see what is going to work for them. If countries want to introduce new vaccines in the future, they're going to have to do something with that schedule because there's no way that everything is going to fit in it. Or they're going to have to move to more combination vaccines, which is happening also. So, okay. Um, may I ask regarding the pneumococcal conjugate vaccines that you mentioned about one plus one in UK that have um, benefit in terms of lower car- carriage and also the antibody response. So what do you think about country like Thailand that never implemented uh, PCV before? Can we use that schedule or because UK used that schedule successfully because they already have like um, implemented for a while and then the exposure is lower? So I think any schedule compared to no schedule at all, <laughs> is better. So so I will say if you want uh, Thailand to sort of, you know, prevent pneumonia and prevent meningitis, I will say introduce any schedule that you prefer. And if that, if, if you're able to convince your minister with two doses better than three doses, I will say go for the UK schedule. There's no reason why you wouldn't do it, right? Uh, but, uh, and again, you can study it and see what the effects are, but I bet you're going to find out the same as they found. I mean, Vietnam is showing the same thing, right? That a one-to-one actually works as well as two plus one. So, yes. Thank you. One more question. Okay, all the way back. Thank you. Um, so I'm just wondering what, what you think about uh, potentially switching from Penta to Hexa in low-income countries and, and the effects that might have on other parts of the schedule. That's a great question because I uh, didn't think, uh, but I do have one slide that I'll show you. And this is work that we did in Guatemala. We compare private clinics. We didn't talk at all about how in many countries, private clinics actually are using a completely different schedule. But we looked at a, you know, a first doses of DTP and MMR first doses and, and third dose of DTP. And what we show is that, you know, the hexavalent vaccine in the private clinics, it was much better about keeping the schedule on time in the first two doses. By the third dose, the private clinics really did very bad. And that was an issue of sort of probably, you know, cost and other things. But uh, the point is, I think any vaccine that you combine will probably do better for sort of keeping all the vaccines that you need in that schedule on time compared to, uh, you know, vaccines that are given in, in different syringes, right? So, so I'd say if we can move to a, from a Penta to an XI, it's probably going to be better. And for the IPV, I will say the advantage is going to be that we're going to prevent a lot of paralytic disease that is happening right now with the CVOPV. But you'll talk with Ananda tomorrow about that. So thank you. Thank you.